Coming up in this episode. I guess like the main thing I've learned is I really don't have like I don't have to eat all the time. Like I think bodies are really good at burning excess calories, right? And then they only end up storing it. I mean, who knows how much more we're eating than we really need to eat. Right. I was always taught as a kid, you know, you have to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. You know, don't skip a meal. It's like, don't skip a meal or you won't be able to think, which might be the case if you're eating a really high carb diet, but it certainly isn't the case if you're only eating meat. Yep. The amount that that meat diet has helped me was that year, even having a fairly severe C. difficile infection, just that year of not being miserably depressed and having an autoimmune disorder was like the best year I've had. Welcome to the HVMN Podcast. What we do with our bodies today becomes the foundation of who we are tomorrow. This is Health via Modern Nutrition. Michaela Peterson, really great to have you back on the HVMN Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me again, and I'm excited to talk. It's been a, about a year since we last spoke officially on the podcast and folks have been following along on the carnivore diet or the Michaela journey have probably seen a lot of interesting updates and we'll dive into all of it. But perhaps before we dive into some of your experiments with carnivore, the new lion's lair, fasting, maybe just an update on personal life. I know you've been traveling a little bit. Um, how are you? How's the family? How, how are you doing? Things are progressing in the right direction. It's been a rough, we had an absolutely brutal summer. Uh, we talked last year, so none of this had happened, but my mom was diagnosed with a very, very rare cancer that had been brewing for a while, but we caught it. There's a collecting duck variant mm. of cancer that was extremely aggressive. And so this summer was just horrible. She had like multiple surgeries and then she had a surgical complication that was extremely rare. So on top of the extremely rare cancer, and then people are aware, I put out a video, dad started taking an anti-anxiety medication during that period of time. Honestly, it was tempting even for me. It was such a horrible experience over the summer. And then he's had a paradoxical response to the anti-anxiety medication. So now we went my mom is better. That's like something to get out of the way. Yeah. Somehow she recovered magically and is doing really well now, although completely traumatized by the experience. But um, she's better. But now we're dealing with dad's health complications. So it's been very stressful. And then you know, like normally social media pressures and things don't really get to me. And I'm already talking about a somewhat controversial diet and saying things like, it made me symptom free from an autoimmune disorder, which is fairly controversial to start with. So I'm pretty immune to drama online. But in the last month, the social media trolls have been absolutely brutal. So that coupled with like family stress um, has been a lot. So I've been trying to figure out how to cope with stress. And I think people who know a bit of my backstory know I was medicated with uh an SSRI or different SSRIs from like the age of 12 till 20. I think I stopped when I was 23. Um, and so I don't think I've really figured out how to have healthy stress coping mechanisms, I guess. Or, you know, um, I don't think the part of my brain that I'm not entirely sure how to explain it, but if I get stressed out, I have a hard time getting down from that. I, and these are extremely stressful situations. So I don't know how much of that is normal or how much of that is because I didn't have, I wasn't able to learn that. And I think part of that was from taking SSRIs for a very long time. Things are good health wise, like excellent, absolutely perfect health wise in regards to me, but managing external stress is tricky. So I'm trying to focus on that. So I'm kind of moving into now that I figured out the like nutrition aspect, at least for me. Uh, I'm trying to move into lifestyle and how to reduce external stressors lifestyle-wise as much as you can. Bouncing off of that, riffing off of that, I mean, I think your situation's pretty bespoke, right? I mean, I think for, even if you're 100% normal, healthy, perfect condition, your mother, you know, someone's mother or parent 
having a serious prognosis and maybe dying, that's traumatizing for anyone. So I yeah. think in your particular situation where you have that kind of situation where I think any normal human response is like, holy crap, like someone that I love and I grew up in my entire life with is has a percentage chance of dying plus yeah. the social media scrutiny plus yeah. the hoopla around there. I, I think it's a very natural response in, in, in terms of you having to deal with things that very few people have to deal with. Obviously, there's a lot of different types of stress in the world. Not to say that, you know, I don't think you're saying, hey, you know, poor me, I'm a victim here. But I think it yeah, is yeah. like compared to a lot of people's levels of stress, it's, it's, it's quite acute. It certainly has been for the last, I would say, approximately six months. Before that, you know, and, and the funny thing about the social media pressure is if I'm not stressed by anything else, the social media pressure doesn't bother me at all. Like a negative article comes out or there are trolls or whatever. It doesn't bother me at all. Sometimes I'm entertained. So it, it's like, but as soon as the stressors start piling up, yep. then anything additional is, is a bit overwhelming. So yeah, like I found fasting helps. And um, cold water immersion has helped a lot for stress too. Yeah, so it sounds like things are on the up and up. So really yeah, glad to hear are. that, which is which is phenomenal. So yeah, let's dive into some of the new explorations, new interventions, new data, new science since the last time we caught up. So just as a refresher, one of our most popular episodes was our conversation about 11, 12 months ago. And at that time, I think there was a big upswell of media and press around the carnivore diet at the time. Yeah. And since then, you've done a lot of experimentation with fasting. And, and, and perhaps that's a good way to start because I think that's something that was one of the, my personal ways of how I got interested in metabolism. How would you step into the fasting world? When I first switched over to just eating beef, it did kind of happen naturally. Like I went from intermittent fasting happened naturally. I went from eating three meals a day to eating two meals a day. Uh, but I was still of the mindset that you should be eating breakfast, which I never really wanted to eat for my entire life. Um, so I was eating breakfast and dinner, or sometimes it'd be lunch and dinner. So it was kind of intermittent fasting sometimes. It was definitely eating fewer meals. Um, after about a year on the diet, I started traveling a bit, um, ended up getting my, I had to get my ankle replacement fixed last January. And I started eating less out of convenience. I was still really worried about eating out. I'm not worried about eating out anymore, which is nice. That like piece of anxiety is gone from my life. Um, but I was worried about eating out. So I went to eating once a day for a while and just could. And I was like, that's really interesting. Like, I'm not, I'm not really hungrier. And then, and then I realized I was probably less hungry. <laughs> so I was eating once a day for a while when I was traveling. So it'd be maybe a week of eating every 24 hours. And I was like, oh, my hunger is actually reduced. So that's interesting. So I did that for a while. And then I started the multi-day fast. Um, I, I started researching it a bit and I thought, well, maybe I'll push it and see what happens. And it yeah. was really difficult at the beginning. Like I, I could do 18 hours easily. It took a while to get to 24 hours. And then I, when I tried to push it past 24 hours to like the 36 hour period, the first time I did that, and I did that at that point without electrolytes, which I know are really helpful now, but I didn't know what I was doing back then. So I tried pushing it and I remember leaving the house being like, I can't work. I can't think. I put my phone down in the cupboard and closed the cupboard. Then I couldn't find my phone for like 40 minutes. I was completely brain foggy the first time I tried to push to 36 hours. Um, and then the next time I tried to push to 36 hours, it was pretty easy. So it was like a really fast turnover. Right. A fast adaptation period. So it sounded yeah. like I, I also re remember seeing you doing your finger sticks. I mean, how, how, like it's a pretty interesting transition going from, I would say, pretty intuitive to now being fairly biohackery or quantitative with all of that. Well, I'm, I'm kind of torn because when I first like went down the whole nutrition road and got to the carnivore diet, I would say I was more trying to biohack than anything. Yep. I was very science oriented and testing oriented. And then my mind was just completely blown by the fact that only eating beef cured, you know, successfully put into remission all my disorders. 
So then I was just mind blown and I was like, I give up on testing anything. Like this is too weird. Yeah. Um, and then it's been interesting, but then I went to visit paleo medicina or medicina in Hungary. I did that last January as well, uh, before my ankle replacement revision. Um, and they were talking about how you want to get your ketone levels to a certain measurement. Yeah. Um, uh, therapeutically and how your glucose should be. They want it to be below 80. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I wonder what mine is. So then I got a keto mojo and started testing that just out of curiosity. And I'm kind of torn between how much of that matters and how much of it doesn't matter. For instance, during fasts, or if I only eat every 24 hours, my ketone levels, um, stay pretty high most of the time. If I only eat every 24 hours, they're high all the time. The more frequently I eat, the lower they get. And then for high, what range are you typically seeing? When you, what, what, do you, what do you consider high? Eat every 24 hours, it's usually 2.4. Okay, yeah, that is fairly high, yep. That, that's fairly high, yeah. If I do the multiple day fast, um, I've gotten really high, 6.4, like high, high. Yep. Um, if I eat three times a day or if I like snack throughout the day, and it's still just snacking on meat, but I'll have jerky sometimes which I generally eat with tallow. So it's not just, you know, it's not as high a protein as jerky would be. But um, my ketone levels can drop to, I can definitely kick myself out of ketosis, especially if I have a whole bunch of jerky. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do find that I'm less hungry and I feel better if I'm at a higher level of ketosis. So the testing has been fun. It's been interesting. The But one thing I would like to say about fasting is, my symptom, the symptoms of my autoimmune disorder did go away before I incorporated fasting, I would say in, yep. and before I was at a high level of ketosis. So when I first started the carnivore diet, I wasn't even eating very much fat because I, I didn't like it. It was nauseating and I don't think I was digesting it well. So I was eating mostly lean cuts of meat and my symptoms still went away. So I don't actually think it was the ketosis that helped. I had been on a ketogenic for ketogenic diet for years prior to the all beef diet. Right. I think it was just removing everything my body was finding inflammatory. Yeah, I mean, like at a very minimum, you had a very strict elimination diet, and it's probably something in either other plants or, or something that were anti nutrients or something that was stimulating a uh, immune response. And it sounds like once you eliminated everything that was triggering an immune response. And then incorporate fasting on top. Then that synergized yeah. well. It wasn't just like intermittent fasting plus eating a broccoli would cure your autoimmune. It was yeah, kind of the inverse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely the anti nutrients or something. Yeah. Um, but fasting has definitely upped my game. I would say it makes me more emotionally stable. And I'm emotionally stable most of the time, unless I'm under some horrible stress, like my mom is about to die from cancer. I'm emotionally stable most of the time. But fasting. I don't know what it does, if it's just the adrenaline increase or what it is, but I am so much more stable fasting than I am eating, even though my stability eating is like is fantastic as well. So that's been like a huge positive thing I found with fasting. And the other reason I've done, so I did a seven day extended fast in September. Yep. Uh, and this was after I realized electrolytes were completely necessary. Um, I've been using the brand Element. Uh, they have unflavored, like pure salt electrolytes. I've mixed yep. my own as well, but I like them. Yeah, and this um, is just sodium and potassium. And a little bit of magnesium. Okay. But um, I did a seven-day fast, kind of out of curiosity to see what would happen. But I also did a DEXA scan early September and found out my body fat percentage was at 34. I was absolutely shocked. In the sense that it was high or low? High. Much, much higher than I was <laughs> expecting. Like like ten percent higher than I was expecting, and I was like, "Well, that's not good." Like even if, even if I think that that looks fine from the outside, that's not healthy. Right. So I figured, okay, well, what's the fastest way to cut down on that? I guess I won't eat for a week, just see what happens. Um, unfortunately, they don't allow you to do DEXA scans repeatedly that quickly, so I still have to do another one. It was a really good experience. It helped a lot with the anxiety of if I go out, I'm sometimes I'm concerned I won't be able to eat, especially if I'm traveling. Like, will I be able to find a steakhouse? Sometimes steakhouses aren't open. I don't want to go to a lower quality one in case they cross contaminate, particularly with gluten. And knowing that I don't have to eat every day, 
is really freeing. Yeah, let's talk about the seven day fast. So I did a seven day fast in early 2017. And just for our listeners out there, it's it's not easy to go directly into a seven day fast. I mean, it's, no. it's quite hard. So for listeners out there, don't expect to be inspired by Michaela or myself and just do a seven day fast tomorrow. Um, I had to try a couple times hitting three days, hitting four days and have, finding it unbearable before I was able to commit and do a seven day fast. For me, I felt like it was almost spiritual in, in, in some weird sense where it really pushed the physical limits of yeah. and mental limits of what you think is possible, as well as there's definitely some sort of mental buzz of having your ketones up to, you know, 5.0 plus. It sounds like you're really hitting your peak ketones when you're doing a seven day fast. Um, can you walk us through that? Okay. What was it like? Well, so like I said earlier, um, I pushed myself to 18 hour fast and then to 24 hours. And then I did a 36 hour one. And then I did a 38 hour one. And then I did a week one. I took video notes too, because I wanted to put it on YouTube and then my phone was stolen. So that's a pain. I have to do another one just to <laughs> re get the video footage. So I ate really, really late the night before. And so then I'm not really hungry until the following night anyway. And then it's pretty easy just to go to bed. After you you pass about 36 hours, it gets I find it gets a little bit easier. It was spiritual. It does give you some sort of high. Um, definitely after day four, I had difficulty sleeping, but I wasn't tired. It'd get to be late, you know, 1.30 or 2.30 in the morning. I was, I was definitely having trouble sleeping. 2.30 in the morning, and I'd think, I'm going to be exhausted tomorrow if I don't get some sleep. And I'd sleep until 6.30. So maybe near the end, I was getting four or five hours of sleep a night. Uh, and I'd wake up and was like, well, you know what? I'm still like pumped. That's exactly how I felt. Exactly. It's like you, I didn't need to sleep that much. It was like four or five hours a night. And I was just yeah. like, I'm fine. Like I'm, I'm clear. I'm lucid. I'm, I'm like a little bit anxious to like get, get things going. Get it, things a, going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, one of the things I really liked is I got more aggressive, but I wouldn't say in a bad way. <laughs> I guess you, you're in hunting mode. You're in go mode or something. I just didn't have time to waste. That's what it felt like. Yeah. The like, especially near the end. So I don't know. I really want to do another one. I think I still have enough body fat so that it's not dangerous. You don't want to do it. Like I I'm sure if, and so you, you pr might've had a harder time too. Um, cause you, you definitely have a much lower body fat percentage. And I know once you get down to a certain level, it, it might be more tiring or a little bit more fatiguing. Yeah, but at I a think certain I, point, it's actually starvation. At a certain point, it's actually malnutrition. Absolutely. You're going to eat into muscle or yeah. something. Yeah. So I think part of, I think some of the things that I noticed that were interesting was that I think at day three, this, the second or third night of sleep, the hunger really attenuated. I think the ketones elevated, which suppressed ghrelin. And yes, I think yes. after like day three, day four, the difficulty was just the same. Like I felt like if you could fast for seven days, you could probably fast for 10 days. Like essentially, yeah. it, like it didn't really matter how long you're fasting, but the first couple of days were the hardest. That's exactly how I felt. I was really surprised by the amount of energy I had. I was surprised about the mood stability. Um, I was very surprised that I didn't get hungrier, Yep. that I got less hungry. I went out for dinner a number of times with my family. And you just sat and looked. Yeah. And like I got made fun of a couple of times. And I was like, <laughs> this doesn't bother me at all. Um, so yeah, it did get easier. I had to. It was a little tricky for the first three days because I have to feed like my kid. Yeah. So I'm, you know, air frying steaks being like, well, <laughs> just wait it out. Just wait it out. It'll get, it'll get easier. But it is hard. It does take quite a bit of self-control um, to stick past the first, you know, 36 to 48 hours because it's really easy to eat. Yeah. Did you exercise? I'm, I'm curious in terms of your I physical did. exercise. So that's like, what's one thing that's interesting when people consider longer term fasts, doing a little bit of exercise to just stimulate muscle, which stimulates growth hormone, which retains lean muscle tissue. I think one of the concerns folks have, you are burning a lot of fat as you're fasting for extended periods of time, but obviously you don't want to be catabolic catabolizing your muscle tissue yeah. as you're adding and incorporating new things into your r routines and protocols. How does physical exercise uh, add in? And, and, and did you incorporate that in your extended fasts? So I did try. Um, generally when I'm doing like, it depends what, 
you would qualify as an extended fast. If I'm doing like 36 or 48, then I'll just do what I normally do. Mm -hmm. But my gym routine isn't like, isn't an intense gym routine. It's basically physio. I'm doing some lift weight, like weightlifting, but, um, it's basically physio. So I wouldn't, I'll get there at some, I'll definitely get there at some point. We'll keep doing these podcasts and people can listen. And I'm going to be super fit at some point, but right now, (laughs) right now it's basically physio. So what I did with the seven day fast is on day three or four, I went to the gym and I did my usual workout, maybe a little bit more intense than usual because I had a whole bunch of extra energy and I was sore for the rest of the fast. (laughs) And I, I was like, well, maybe that's muscle growth, but I think Oh, this is another thing I should mention. I think what happened was I got dehydrated. Mm. I found that at the very beginning, I needed a lot of electrolytes to stay functioning, a lot of salt to stay functioning, especially for the first two days. And then on the third day, I felt a little bit better. And then on the fourth day, I wasn't even thirsty anymore. And I was like, well, maybe it's a dry fast. Like, I don't know what's going on. My, I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. So then I worked out. And I think what happened is I got dehydrated and I didn't have I, I didn't, I wasn't having muscle cramps. So I don't think it was electrolytes. I think it was dehydration, yep. but, um, I really wasn't thirsty at all. So it took maybe a day and a half or two days for me to be like, okay, my muscles still hurt, drink a whole bunch of electrolytes and water. Yep. And I had to kind of force myself to do that. And then the muscle pain went down. So one of the mistakes I made with the, that extended fast was once I stopped being hungry and I stopped being thirsty, I thought, eh, I'll just wait. But, um, I think next time I do it, I'll have to force myself more near the end to drink water and have electrolytes, uh, even if I'm not particularly thirsty. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point for folks who are considering or, or learning about this for the first time. When you are fasting, your insulin load drops. And when you have low insulin, your body excretes out more and more sodium. And that's where electrolyte replacement, and, and this has a fancy way of just saying, just eating some table salt would work too. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And I remember when I was doing you know, day five, day six, just having a little bit of salt water in the morning helped in a the lot. In the morning. Yeah. In the morning in particular. Yeah. Near the end, day like, day five, day six, same as you, uh, I'd wake up and I would feel glitchy. I don't know if you got glitchy, but it was very specifically like a computer program that was glitchy. <laughs> and like, I woke up a couple of times, I think it was day five and day six when I woke up in the morning and I thought, this is not comfortable. Yeah. I am not comfortable. Something, something is wrong and I should eat something. And then I'd have a, like a big glass of water with salt and then 15 minutes later, everything would be fine. Yeah. But that first waking up in the morning, um, and then the night of day six, so it's coming back to me a little bit more. The night of day six, I actually woke up in the middle of the night and had some salt water because that stopped the morning of day seven from being like glitchy and weird. Yeah. It was definitely a strange experience, but it wasn't scary and it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. And there were a lot of benefits. And it's kind of addictive. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about your ketone levels. I mean, just to give a sense of the range for our listeners out there, usually above 0.5 is considered nutritional ketosis. And then I think depending on your 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 starting conditions, your goals. I mean, I think when I was at the end of my seven-day fast, I hit 5.4. sounded like you were even a little bit higher. I was higher, yeah. Usually you'd expect to be 1.0, 3.0 between day two and three. And you, you need that ketones, right? Because if you're not having carbohydrate or any other energy substrate, you got to be having ketones. So yeah. I think that's probably the hard part. If you aren't fat adapted, if you haven't been yeah. eating very low carb, haven't been doing 36, 18 hour fast or 36 hour fast, it's very hard for your body to shift into ketone production. And then you just feel like really, really crappy. Yeah, really crappy. And then I'm curious to hear about your glucose. Obviously, one of the goals that you had was keeping your blood sugar under 80 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to consider. It's just not chasing keto numbers. It's also making sure your glucose is under control. Curious to hear about uh, the glucose trajectory. So for that seven-day fast, um, I started, I think I started at 94. Okay. And that was testing after I ate my last meal. And I had eaten a lot that day because... I was like preparing. And just for context, it was this fasted in the morning? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And then typically in the morning, under 100 is considered healthy. 
under 120 is considered pre-diabetic. A fasted blood glucose of above 120 is considered a, a sign of, of, of type 2 diabetes. So yeah. you had a pretty good glucose control. You woke up after a heavy meal under 100. So Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if I had any type of carb if that just shot up like ridiculously. I feel like my glucose does rise a bit faster than it should, even if I'm just eating meat. Like I can get it, if I try really hard, I can get it above 100. Which And in the greater scheme of things, that's still healthy, but yeah. I do try and keep it below 80 okay. rather than 100. Um, and I'm only taking that information based on what the folks at Paleo Medicina are telling me yep. um, is ideal. And I, I can kind of understand that. Yeah. So I started at 94. It dropped pretty quickly that day to 84. And then for the next five days, it was pretty much the same. It, it wasn't the same. It did go up and down a little bit. I think it changed when I exercised. Yes. I can't remember what it did. I just remember. I think maybe it had gone up. Yeah. It, it should go up when you exercise. That's one of the counterintuitive things that I yeah. noticed when I had a continuous glucose monitor. And it makes sense, right? I mean, it, it, what's happening there is your body needs more energy, more substrate, and your stored glucose, your glycogen breaks down and, and you have a little bit of blood sugar rise as your muscles need that fuel. So it, it, exactly. Yeah, that, that's exciting. So, so that was, but, but after the exercise, then it basically stayed the same and, um, it hovered around 65, which might, that might seem low to people, but I was totally fine. Um, so that's where I kind of stuck at for the rest of the fast. Like, uh, like you're never going to get to zero. <laughs> and I think yeah. that there should be no, people shouldn't like target no blood sugar. There's always no. going to be some ambient blood sugar because your body needs actual some sugar to function. Um, but yeah, 65 is quite a uh, controlled level. Yeah. What what were yours? What were yours at for your extended fast? I actually don't remember my blood sugar. I, 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 I think of the ketones more, but. Ketones are way more fun to measure because they basically keep going up while well, they stop at a certain yeah. point, but. Those are more fun. Glucose is it's pretty stable once you do those extended Yeah, I fasts. think it's I, I it must have been around between sixty and eighty, um, which is probably the an expected range if you're doing extended day fasts. Yeah. Any other tips or tricks? Sounds like salt electrolytes were huge. Um, some of the sleeping, and I think for me, I think it was like a, I think from the spiritual or self discipline perspective, I thought, I thought that was interesting. Just obviously, you have a sense of that as you do you know thirty six hour fast. You know that you the food routine doesn't control you. You can control your food consumption. Yeah. Um, but I'm just like remembering back to some of the uh, kind of religious context where you have Moses talking about him fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, or folks going to the Greek academies fasting, monks fasting. And I, and I, and I think I somewhat empathize with that kind of rhetoric or thinking because you just feel like you're in a kind of a very clear, lucid state. Yeah. I guess like the main thing I've learned is I really don't have like I don't have to eat all the time. I don't know how and I don't even know how often the weird thing is I don't know how frequently I actually have to eat in order to maintain my weight. Like I think bodies are really good at burning excess calories. Yeah. Right? And then they only end up storing it. I mean, who knows how much more we're eating than we really need to eat. Right. Um, but I like I have a sneaking suspicion I probably only have to eat every 36 hours to maintain my body weight. Although I'm not like heavily exercising or anything. So maybe that'll change once I'm, once I'm exercising more. But I think that was the most interesting thing I learned is, oh, miss a meal. I was always taught as a kid, you know, you have to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, don't skip a meal. It's like, don't skip a meal or you won't be able to think which might be the case if you're eating a really high carb diet, but it certainly isn't the case if you're only eating meat. Yep. It seems like you actually just need less sleep. And maybe that has something to do with the fact that your digestive system isn't like Working. really on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. I loved it. I want to do another one. I'll do, I'll put it up on, um, I'll probably put it up on Instagram and Facebook so people can join. If but I, t I told people last time, only only do those extended ones if you're used to the, you know, 36, 48 hour range. Yeah, let me know. I'd maybe, yeah, I'd, I'd love to join you as well. And I'm Ooh, sure our okay. audience members would, would too. But I think that's the right caveat and right disclosure. Don't just 
jump in. It's like, I wouldn't advocate go run a marathon if you haven't exactly. done some training. And I think this is the same exact context. Like, I'm not going to be able to lift 500 pounds on a, on a yeah. bench press. I haven't trained to do that. And same thing with the seven-day fast. I mean, that's a pretty aggressive way to start. So what else have you been testing? I know that Zill flagged that you've been testing your microbiome. People have been asking you for all sorts of blood work and metrics. Um, what are some of the most interesting things that you've learned that are counterintuitive or have surprised the critics or you thought are especially interesting? I think obviously the microbiome is a hot topic. It's not super well understood what is an optimal microbiome, but yeah. have, you, have you looked at it? Have they, have they evolved? But before you answer that question, let's take a quick break. Protein. It's an essential macronutrient for health. If you're already listening to this podcast, you probably know that. Safe to say we all love protein. Just think about the explosive popularity of protein powders. They're convenient. They're everywhere. However, they're not all healthy. Conventional protein powders are high in carbohydrates. Some even have as much as 25 grams of added sugar per scoop. Per scoop. Sheesh. Keto Collagen Plus is HVMN's take on protein powder, a tasty product that incorporates robust, modern nutritional science. And Keto Collagen Plus is, you guessed it, keto-friendly and replaces the carbs and sugars instead with high-quality fat. Our protein source? Collagen peptides that boost natural collagen production, which is the most abundant protein in our bodies. The fat source? C8 medium-chain triglycerides, shown to have the best ketogenic effect over any other fat source. Add a scoop of Keto Collagen Plus to just about anything to build stronger bones, healthy hair, glowing skin, and a robust microbiome. It comes in chocolate, vanilla, and unflavored options. Learn more by checking out Keto Collagen Plus on our website, hvmn.com. You can also click the link in this episode's description. So I don't know if I talked about, I don't know if I've talked about it last time I was on, but when I switched over, this is a complicating factor that I'm pretty um, open about. But when I switched over to the all beef diet, all my autoimmune symptoms went away and I started experiencing pretty bad C. difficile symptoms. Hmm. Well, it turns out I had a C. difficile infection and I didn't contract it at the same time as I started the diet. Like, I think what happened was I had a very messed up microbiome to begin with from years and years and years of antibiotics after being born from a, a C-section. So I think I was just like doomed that way to begin with. And then I switched over to this carnivorous diet and all the carb eating bacteria or, or like good portions of that, they do die off. Yep. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if that's what's keeping C. difficile in check, it's not great. And I've had a, not a number, I've had a couple of people who switched over to the diet and have experienced the same thing. Mm. If that much of your microbiome is C. difficile and it's just being kept in check by carb eating bacteria, then that's a problem by itself. But if you switch over to an all meat diet, I think those die off and then I think you kind of start developing, and this is just me putting it out there, but I think it makes sense that you start developing the microbiome to tolerate an all meat diet after the carb bacteria die off right. and in between that period of time, the C. diff shot up. Yep. So makes it, sense. It, yep. it makes sense and it, it was unpleasant to say the least. So part of the reason I started fasting actually was because um, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm taking antibiotics to get rid of a problem that was caused by, probably caused by antibiotics. Right. Um, maybe fasting will help. It didn't. <laughs> Even the extended fasts didn't. What were the symptoms? How did you know there was a C? I mean, how did you even know? How did you even know what to look? I mean, obviously, a gut microbiome test isn't necessarily something that your doctor tells you to do. No, no, no. It was a uh, symptom based. Okay. So, I, like a lot of people who switch over to the carnivorous diet, from from the people I've spoken with, about sixty percent get diarrhea for the first approximately two weeks after a couple of days on the diet. And who knows what that's caused, if it's microbiome change or if it's difficulty digesting fats or if it's a keto flu or, or what, or a yep. combination. Yep. Um, so that's pretty normal. But mine didn't really go away. I had pretty pretty obvious signs now that I know what C. difficile, a C. difficile infection is like. It was like basically diarrhea after I ate. Mm. So I had my microbiome tested through the natural path. Um, and that gives you a little bit more 
a little bit more in depth story. Although honestly, who knows how much we know about the microbiome in the first place right. anyway, but, um, the seeds, like the clostridium bacteria were high there. And so I actually went to my doctor, my GP and was like, test that. And he did. And I came back positive for that. And then I didn't want to take antibiotics. So I went to the Taymount clinic and they're doing fecal microbiome transplants. And over the next three months, I did 15 of those. Whoa. Interesting. And they have a success rate of one time has an 80% success rate and two times it's like 95. And I did it like 15 times and it didn't work. Huh. I'm not actually going to talk about it on here because I'm going to put out a video. Okay. But I figured out how to get rid of it. I did get rid of it. Um, it took a lot of research. That's gone. So that's why I said like my health is great now. My digestion, my digestion is perfect. And the amount that that meat diet has helped me was that year, even having a fairly severe C. difficile infection, just that year of not being miserably depressed and having an autoimmune disorder was like the best year I've had, right. even with that infection. But I did figure out how to treat it, and I am going to put that on YouTube. And I do have tests to show that it was successful. So I did microbiome tests throughout this whole thing to try and fix what's going on. Yeah. because, um, And I know there are a number of carnivores in the space that think that the microbiome doesn't really matter. And even the folks at uh, Paleo Medicina think that if you're on a, this like super high fat meat diet long enough that things just fix themselves. Right. But that wasn't my experience at all with an actual infection. Um, so I, I, th I think once you've you know decimated your microbiome with antibiotics for like two decades or generations, who knows, um, you need to be a, a little bit more proactive with fixing that and it's not just diet related. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if you just had a deranged microbiome to begin with and the carb uh, consuming microbiome yeah. was holding the C. difficile in check and then you release the kraken, if you will, and the C. difficile takes over, I mean, it makes sense. And it, it it's interesting to hear that the benefits of a carnivore diet were so compelling that even if you had to have essentially fairly consistent diarrhea <laughs> and deal with that over a year that uh, the carnivore diet was so beneficial on the other attributes of your, your yeah. health that it was it was huge and and it was interesting to hear about the fecal uh, transplant because we've had on the podcast Dr. Josiah Zayner who's well known biohacker and, and I think he got some publicity and some notoriety for doing like the first uh, amateur microbiome transplant so he's like literally collecting his friends. Uh, uh, <laughs> feces yeah. and making his own um <laughs> own 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 cocktail there so it's interesting to see that you tried you know multiple times you know a number of times and it wasn't hitting so i'm curious i'm very curious to see that video when it comes out if you weren't using antibiotics it wasn't a fecal transplant what kind of routine did you have to do so that will be fun yeah I, I i guess just like stepping back a little bit i mean i feel like the mainstream adoption or acceptance of carnivore has evolved a bit. I mean, if we just kind of review the the last year, I mean, I think a year ago, it's just like everyone is insane. The Peterson yeah. family is insane. Now I would say that there's quite a bit more doctors and folks who are much more open to it. I wouldn't say people are like, hey, carnivore is the best diet for everyone. But I think yeah. you have people accepting that, okay, this could be reasonable for some people. Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. There was like a period of time... <laughs> They're like, oh, no, well, everyone's going to die in eight months. And then that eight-month period ended, and they're like, well, okay. I guess <laughs> I guess people can survive on this, but it's still a bad idea. Yeah. It'll evolve a little bit further in the coming years, I'm sure. What is it like being at, you know, one of the central characters here? It's weird. Like, the people, <laughs> it's just such a weird group of people that decide to do something as I don't want to call the carnivore diet ridiculous, but as ridiculous as the carnivore diet, because you get the people who have literally tried everything and just want to get better. Yep. And then you get the really open, fairly smart group of people who want just want to biohack. So you get you get open people and then you get really sick people. Try doing those extended fasts and just being sent hundreds of pictures of steak. I've just sent hundreds of pictures. I don't know how this became my life exactly. But um, <laughs> I put up a I put up a photo about a month ago and I went to a shooting range in the in the states. Um, 
so I put up a picture and it was like, I had lamb that evening. So I had like lamb and then it was a video of me at the shooting range and I had a glass of bourbon. And then it's quite American. It was very American. I thought it was pretty <laughs> funny. And so I put that on Instagram and then I've had hundreds of people send me <laughs> pictures of their steak with some sort of weapon beside their steak. And I figured I'd just keep reposting those until they stopped making me laugh. Uh, and they haven't stopped making me laugh yet. It's definitely some <laughs> meme content that's going to be generated from this from this movement. Yeah, it's it's been fun, though. It's a supportive community for the most part. I'm hoping people can... I can understand why people become... I don't want to say ideologically possessed by the idea, but if you if something dramatic happens, like you heal from an autoimmune disorder, it's going to be really hard to not talk about it, as exemplified yeah. by me. But I think it's a natural phenomenon. People want to associate and and just share experiences with like minded people. Yeah. I, I think that's what is a core part of human experience. I mean, we could we could talk a little bit about that. But one thing that I think strikes me as a sign that this is a growing interest area is that there's like sub families or sub schools of thought within carnivore. Uh, I would say that a year ago, no one really thought too much about the nuances of how to best implement a carnivore diet. And I think now you have people saying, oh, you got to have organ meats, you got to have yeah. liver, brains, et cetera, et cetera. You got to eat nose to tail. Is, is that something that you follow? Is that something that you try to incorporate? Um, any nuances or refinements to your daily nutrition? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I, I renamed the version of the carnivore diet I'm doing. I'm calling it the lion diet, um, which sounded more attractive to me than all I eat is beef yeah, or other ruminant animal meat. <laughs> um, so I've been calling it the ruminant, I mean, the, the lion diet. And yeah, I don't know how I feel about all the iterations. Like, I mean, I have my own iteration. So who am I to say what's right exactly, except for what worked for me. But um, dairy was also always extremely inflammatory for me. So the idea, and eggs as well, uh, probably the egg whites. So the idea that, oh, the carnivore diet works and it's all animal products, I was never, never on board with that because dairy was one of the first things I cut out that gave me terrible, terrible arthritis. Mm. Um, it was like grains and dairy and soy. They were all at the top. Um, so that's why I was calling it an all beef diet for a long time. Um, and then this nose to tail idea, I don't buy into that. There isn't enough. I don't particularly buy into that there. I don't think there's enough actual evidence out there to suggest you need certain things. And there are a number of people, myself included, um, who are mainly eating muscle meat, fatty muscle meat, who aren't vitamin deficient. In fact, one thing interesting thing that's happened in the last year that was really exciting is I've been vitamin D deficient and zinc deficient since I was seven. Hmm. Um, my vitamin D is still low. I haven't been able to get that up, but my zinc has recovered for the first time in my entire life. Nice. Um, which makes sense on a high meat diet, but it wasn't like that when I was doing keto and I was eating, you know, I was probably eating more meat, honestly on my keto diet than I am now, just not percentage wise. So my vitamins and then my B vitamins, which got completely diminished, um, after I was 20, a number of them, those have all recovered. So all my vitamins except vitamin D, uh, have recovered. Got to get some sun. I guess it's, is it hard to get some sun in Canada? Is, what's, what's the deal I've there? Been, I've been trying really hard this year. Uh, I was in the Bahamas for a long time. I went, I was in Florida for the winter, like, and I've been tanning and I was outdoors all summer and I'm fairly like, I don't know if you could, well, I'm getting pay, more pale now. I've been fairly tanned and that that's definitely, this vitamin D thing is definitely part of whatever the underlying problem is mm. with being so sensitive. It has something to do with it, but I mean, it is Canada, but I don't think it has anything to do with that per se. I think okay. it's something else, but, um, I, I craved liver in the winter. I did. Mm. Um, I always hated like absolutely despised liver. And then 10 months into eating only muscle meat, I had a bit of liver and I thought, oh my God, this is sweet. This isn't bitter. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but you could taste, I guess you can taste the carbs in the liver. There's a little bit of carb in the liver. Uh, and so I had 
quite a bit of that over the winter. And then in the summer, I didn't really, it started to taste, I didn't like the taste again. So I stopped eating it. Um, maybe that had something to do with the fact that there's less sun and you need more vitamin D. Maybe it has something to do with that in the winter. But I've basically been telling people go based on your body, like trust, trust your body and trust your cravings. I don't think you need to take organ supplements or swallow frozen liver if you hate it. Um, I think, I think once you remove some of the inflammatory problems in your body, it'll kind of tell you what it wants. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if I started craving liver again this winter and then I'll eat it. But otherwise I really just eat very fatty cuts. I don't eat lean cuts at all anymore because they make me kind of like angry after I eat them. I'm just not satisfied. But, um, but that's my iteration of the carnivore diet, I guess, is ruminant meat, ruminant fatty meat, organs if you want to, and if you crave them, they might be a good idea to include if you're low in vitamin D, probably. Got it. So yeah, it, it, just to summarize or, or, or clarify here, so the lion diet by Michaela Peterson is, what are the core tenets, if you will? It sounds like it's ruminant meats. Is this just yeah. beef now, or are you considering lamb? Other 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 ruminants. Uh, um, anything anything ruminant seems to be fine. Um, okay. Buys like the wild game is generally leaner, so I and it's more expensive, so I don't normally eat it, but I don't react to it. Um, I've had a number of people from India who can't get beef right. reach out, and they've had success having you know goat and mutton. Um, so I don't think I think as long it seems as if as if it if it's a ruminant animal, it seems to be just as effective as long as you keep the fat intake high enough so that you're satiated. Right. Do you have a do you do you make a clear distinction between grass fed versus grain fed? Again, that's one of those new sub nuance points where people can have little religious arguments about that. Yeah. Um obviously grass fed's a little bit or quite a bit more expensive. Yeah. And I think, you know, the argument is you want a higher ratio of omega-3 saturated uh, or polyunsaturated fat versus yeah. omega-6, which, yeah. you know, makes sense. But is that a huge something that you've noticed that is important for your uh, your lifestyle? Um, no. So when I first was doing the, an extremely limited keto diet, I was only eating grass fed because I wanted to rule out the possibility that conventionally raised beef, I guess, was contributing to my autoimmune symptoms. But, and so for the first part of the carnivore diet, I also only ate grass fed. And then I got a little bit more relaxed and I started eating. In Canada, it's, we don't get like, we don't really get soy fed and corn fed beef as well. We get corn fed a bit, but like the soy fed, the stuff that is lower quality, we don't, get as much in Canada. So it's hard for me to comment on that, but I don't respond negatively to grain fed. Um, I am going to do a grass fed test where I only do that. I think I'll do it. I probably have to do it for a while to see what happens. So two months, I guess I'll, I'll only do grass fed and I'll see if I feel any different, but, um, I'm pretty careful about being adamant about only eating grass fed because a lot of people who are really ill with autoimmune disorders, just having that, just telling them that they need to cut out all their favorite foods and switch over to eating meat, that is enough yep. without saying also it's going to cost a lot because you only have to eat grass, you can only eat grass fed yep. because the other stuff isn't good. When I got better eating grain fed beef, all my symptoms went away eating grain fed beef. So that's good enough. And then I think once you're healthy and you want to say, okay, well, I want to eat sustainably, I want to eat grass fed switch over to that. Like I try and do grass fed now because I can afford it. You want to eat sustainably, you know, it's probably better for the environment, that kind of thing. But yep. my main goal is to get people to stop having autoimmune disorders and then they, they can worry about the rest of that. So I'm not part of the whole, it needs to be grass fed camp. Okay. So, and then in terms of seasoning, you're a salt person, you're, you're a salt girl, like yeah, no pepper, not nothing, maybe some salt. Salt, salt definitely. So ruminant, I, I, salt, don't need to be too religious or dogmatic on grass versus grain. You don't need to be just beef or just sheep or just mutton or, or whatnot. Anything else that's part of the lion's diet, the official lion's diet? Well, um, I tell people if they want to cheat, um, 
I didn't have autoimmune responses to bourbon and vodka, <laughs> which sounds crazy. I had terrible hangovers though. If you don't have carbs and you drink, holy cow, are the, <laughs> are, are the hangovers bad? But um, I tell people, it's hard to get rid of all your vices at the same time. So if you need a vice, like vodka and soda water or bourbon and soda water. How rigorous are your experiments here? I mean, you, you go through tequila, gin, you, you went through everything. Yeah, yeah. So um, it turns out, well, at first I thought I was just reacting to alcohol. So I'd wake up. This is when, this is before the beef diet. This yeah. is when I was still including salad. Uh, I'd wake up the morning after and I'd be itchy. And I was like, ah, oh, like my whole body would be itchy. So like, okay, well, that's definitely some sort of autoimmune response. That's not just a hangover. Um, but it wouldn't happen every time I drank. So I didn't really know what was going on. And then I went out um, and I had gin somewhere and, and I got, an autoimmune response after that. So I wasn't just itchy. Uh, my digestion was messed up. My arthritis came back and my skin broke out. And I was like, what is going on? Maybe they accidentally added something to my drink, but it turns out beef eaters gin adds almond extract, yep. uh, which is something people with nut allergies should know. Um, and so I was like, oh my God, I thought all 40% alcohols were pure alcohol, but it's not true. It turns out the only alcohols that are as pure as you can make them are unflavored vodka. Turns out Ciroc too adds sugar. Their unflavored vodka adds sugar. I found that out uh, because I got itchy. But uh, um, unflavored vodka, bourbon gets its color from the, age, from the casks it's aged in. And I don't seem to react to that, shockingly. So that's okay, but... How about whiskey? I mean, bourbon and whiskey are somewhat related. I mean, have you... But technically, <laughs> yeah. so scotches generally add caramel coloring to uh, give them color, which is derived from sugar. Yep. Um, gold tequila is the same way. Silver tequila doesn't have anything added after it's distilled. So you could throw silver tequila in there, but I find silver tequila repulsive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not drinking anymore. Um, because that was advice I didn't need. And I don't think I need, so I'm not drinking anymore, but I tell people if they do need a break or if they're at a party and they're like socially anxious cause they can't eat what everybody's eating. I didn't have an autoimmune response. It didn't make me depressed to have, you know, a bit of vodka with soda water or a bit of bourbon with soda water. So that's part of the diet, but it's probably better if you don't drink, but it doesn't seem to cause an autoimmune flare up, which is mostly what I'm concerned about. Yeah, and I'm sure that it's very easy at this point just to have a soda water. Yeah, and uh, likewise, I rarely drink. And if I feel like I need to have something in my hand, so easy to just have a soda water. And if you're not, yeah. you know, have an issue with lime, I have a soda water with lime. And it's just, it just, no one cares. So, no, 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 nobody cares. Um, My problem with alcohol was anxiety, really. Even, um, which I don't really have anymore, but it was still, I'm, I was so used to going out and drinking that um, it made me more comfortable. Although my al my response to alcohol has changed since I got healthier. It's not as fun as it was. It was more of a relief before when I wasn't healthy. And now it's just like I get kind of slow and then I feel terrible the next day. I was like, oh, maybe I should just cut that out completely. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, just, it's fascinating because I feel like you're so sensitive to your body's responses now. It's a very accurate barometer of what is good and not good for you, which I think a lot of people just lack these days because they're just, they don't need to. And I think that they just lose sensitivity yeah. to how their body feels. So, yeah, I mean, that's super helpful. And I know that you recently launched the lion's lair. Do you want to tell us about, you know, the lion's lair and then perhaps some of the other projects that you have in the works here? Yeah, actually, I've got a bunch going on. Um, it's pretty exciting. So the lion's lair, um, I was doing consultations a long time ago and I had to stop because I got too busy and well, that was mostly why, but I've launched the lion's lair, which is a group. It's almost 40 people now of people who generally have some sort of honestly like heartbreaking <laughs> illness that they're trying to get under control. And it's kind of a way to group I wouldn't want to, I don't want to say freak out together, but when you first start the diet, if you go from especially like the standard American diet to the lion diet or the carnivore diet, um, it's really scary and isolating. And I realized that when I went 
when I switched over, I didn't have anyone to talk to about it and it made it a lot harder. So this is a group for people who need someone to talk to about it and who don't want to feel so isolated because you're always going to have people telling you you're nuts. And it's really hard having an autoimmune condition or having a mood disorder in particular. Um, and then trying to do a ridiculous diet that nobody understands yet. And then having your entire social circle tell you you're nuts. So I tried to design a place that was like a social circle for support. Um, and so far people are finding it really useful. I'm, I've been, you know, I go in there every day to check in on everybody and I've been doing weekly like Q and A's. So it gives you access to a Facebook group. And I've been trying to keep the number down because the bigger the Facebook group, the more chaotic it gets. And then I don't find that I'm helping people as much. So I go in there weekly and I'll do a Q and a talk to people, um, kind of show them how I cook. So put recipes up there. But, um, I think apparently it's helpful for people to have kind of the sense of community. So I launched that. That's, um, the lion's lair. Uh, Congrats. I'm be... I think that's like maybe like what a couple weeks old, almost a month old at this point. It just, it just started. Yeah. yeah. It's brand new. Yeah. So congrats. I, obviously Thank it's, you. it's always fun and exciting and also, uh, scary. A scary. Bit. Yeah. I mean, it's just like a new thing, like, but it sounds like good traction and, 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 and good buy-in so far. So let's see. Yeah. 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 Excited to see and how that evolves. Me too. Me too. And I'm going to give people access to, well, Okay, so what else am I working on? I'm still working on the autobiography. I'm not ready for that to have an ending yet. I'm hoping like next March will be a good place for like the story of my autoimmune disorder to end. Um, so I'm working on the autobiography. I'm working on a how-to guide, which I'm hoping to put out in the next three months. Um, and it'll kind of go into how to jump into the carnivore diet. And I'll be focusing on the lion diet, so like extreme elimination diet how to jump into that, like jump right in or how to do it slowly. Cause a lot of people with autoimmune disorders, it's actually easier on their body if they wean down the carbs. Um, so I'll be trying to focus on those two. I'm hoping that'll be really helpful to people. And then the other thing I'm excited about is I'm going to be starting a podcast. I figured I'd, I might as well start a yeah. podcast. So, um, yeah, so maybe late November that should be getting launched. So those are like the three, I'm redesigning my website so that it looks less like a WordPress blog that a 24-year-old built <laughs> who didn't know how to use WordPress. Um, so yeah, things are ramping awesome. up. Yeah, a lot of content and education coming out there. Anything on the experimental side or the biohacking side that you're curious about? Obviously, a lot of, you know, I guess a lot of the educational side. I'm just curious, are there exercises or different variations of fasting or nutrition that you've wanted to do or different exercises you want to incorporate that you wanted to do and you're just planning that out? Um, yeah. So, um, I, I really want to get stronger because I'm really not strong right now. And I had this ankle revision surgery last January and the surgeons told me it takes a year and a half for the soft tissue to stop being swollen. Like my ankle is still visibly swollen. It's very frustrating. So I, I really have to take it easy on the fitness probably for, oh my God, a year and a half, another like eight months, which is really frustrating. But every time I push it, it swells. So there's like, there's no pushing it. Yep. Um, so hopefully at some point, like I said earlier, I'll get really fit, but that's going to take a while. Um, and then for biohacking, I'm really interested in mindset at the moment and how much that can change your perspective or whatever reality you're in. So I think I'm going to be doing some research or some tests. I like this extended fasting. I'm going to continue doing that. But I, I might be looking into meditation, um, see where that brings me. And I also want to delve a little bit into breathing techniques. So I think I'm going to give Wim Hof a listen for a while and see what that does because – just my experiencing my experience with fasting has well who knows where mindset can take you so i, I kind of want to delve into that i'm excited about that yeah let's definitely um, have you back on when when you've given that exploration because i think one of the <laughs> interesting things that i've had in terms of talking with world champion ironman athletes or endurance athletes i mean because they're competing on seven eight nine hour races 
it ends up being more of a mental challenge than a physical challenge, or, or at least the mental component is just as important. And I think they, in my my perception of their mental state is that it's almost they they turn themselves into the meditative flow state. And I think there's an yeah. interesting thing there where are we tapping into from a fasting perspective and what Zen monks or priests are doing to get into a a prayer or meditative state there is there something from an athletic flow state that's all interrelated or correlated i think there's something interesting there oh, there's definitely something interesting there and like that's exactly what i want to look into and maybe there's an easier way to do that through meditation or through breathing techniques than having to not eat for like 50 hours plus <laughs> so um we'll see but uh that's that's the direction i'm heading in Awesome. Hey, this is super fun to catch up again, and we'll have to have you back on soon again. Thanks so much, and we'll Thanks speak to you again me. soon. Yeah, talk soon. If you're interested to learn more about HVMN, visit www.hvmn.com pod. Thank you for tuning in.